John Evans, uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, how are you? Doing well, Peter. Good to be speaking with you again. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a few months since the last time we had the opportunity. This time things uh, have moved uh, along with Kick at Six. Uh, I've been keeping uh, an eye on the project. And, uh, and this is the reason why we decided to get together today and talk about the upcoming Kick at Six, which uh, I think is going to be a big deal. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to KeyCAD 6 being out in the wild and seeing everyone use it. Perfect. Well, before we get started uh, with my questions and your answers, could you take a minute to tell us a little bit about you and especially what is your role in the KeyCAD project? Absolutely. So my name is John Evans and I'm one of the lead developers of KeyCAD. I've been working on the project for quite a while now and um, for, for some years now I've been on the lead development team which means I'm, I'm part of the team of volunteers who decides the direction of the project and, and decides what will, will go into each release and, and helps to implement new features and, and fix bugs that are found by our users. Perfect. So you are, I was thinking about this because I recently uh, wrote an article about Kick at Six. Uh, I, I took a couple of weeks to play with the, um, Oh, it's not a release candidate yet. Uh, it's it's code named 5.99. It's the nightly build that eventually is going to become Kick at Six. So I took a couple of weeks to play around with it and compare it to Kick at Five, and wrote an article about it. Uh, people read it and they sent me questions, <laughs> and I thought, well, who is best to answer those questions? Uh, and that was you. That's why I invited you to have this session with me. So uh, I've got some questions there as well. Uh, most of these questions came from readers. So um, if you're ready, I, I can start asking. Oh, let's go. <laughs> okay. Now the first one is from me, but it's a question that I get a lot uh, from a lot of people. And that has to do with uh, Kick at 6 timeline. And you know, when do you approximately think that Kick at 6.0 uh, might be out? That's, that's the biggest question, isn't it? Uh, I hear that a lot as well. So we, you know, we're an open source project and we are um, getting work done through the work of volunteers. And those volunteers are, are working on KeyCAD diligently, but they also have, you know, the rest of their lives going on. And um, in, the, in the past year or so, there's been a lot of volatility in the world, and that's impacted all of our developers as well. Some, some people's schedules have changed in ways they didn't anticipate, and some things have changed about jobs and things like that. So that's why it's a little bit harder for us to come up with a very concrete release schedule compared to some commercial projects. But what I can say is we're very close. We have a couple more features um, one of which is, is the new Python API that everyone is looking forward to who does Python scripting with KiCad that are not yet in. And we're, we're waiting to get those in before we are ready to say that the only thing standing between us and release is, is fixing bugs. And in the meantime, while some developers are working on that, the rest of us are, are working on fixing bugs that are found by our users who are testing the nightly builds, the 599 builds. And we have a you know a good list of bugs. Um, some of those it might be decided at the end of the day that they're low priority bugs. They don't you know maybe there's a workaround and it's just something that could work a little bit better, and we might put that off from the 6.0 initial release. But all of the severe bugs, the kind of bugs that might cause you to lose work or or um, get in the way of getting a, a serious design done. We want to fix those before release because we want everyone who is upgrading from the 5.1 stable release to 6.0 to have just as smooth an experience and in fact a smoother experience due to all the improvements we don't want them to upgrade and say oh this you know this upgrade looks nice but it works um doesn't work as well as the old version does so yeah. we are basically looking for that that state more than a particular date and at the rate that we've been going, you know, definitely this year, we're, we'll have six out. Um, and, and hopefully in the, in the first half of this year, it, it's, looking, it's looking pretty possible. Um, but I just wanted to give that longer explanation because we still do face a lot of uncertainty caused by 
you know, what's going on in the daily lives of the developers who are writing this code. And we're all doing the best we can, but uh, it's, it's hard to give a fixed date other than, you know, the list of things that is left to do is getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, uh, that that's uh, that's great. Uh, I wasn't expecting um, a specific date, like by the first of July, because <laughs> uh, I did not realize that you actually have uh, new features that you are still working on. Um, my understanding was that you were fixing bugs at the moment, and everything big, like the the new file structure, for example, were was completed. But yeah, the um, the API for the Python scripting that is uh, like a fundamentally new feature. Uh, it did exist previously, but I think you're expanding it a lot. And because I do have a question about this later on, maybe I can just um, bring it up to my list and ask you now, can you tell us more about this feature and uh, what kind of applications do you see people developing based on Python scripting and its API? Sure. So Python scripting has been a part of the, uh, the PCB editor for KiCad for a while now. And some of our users have, have done a lot of incredible things with this to expand what is possible to do and what is easy to do in KiCad. And we'd like to encourage that. One of the problems with the existing Python API has been the way it was designed makes it pretty hard to maintain the underlying code, which is written in C++, with the, the Python code that all of our users who are developing Python plugins are, are developing. It's hard to keep those in sync and it, it caused some friction over time. And what we set out to do was to solve two problems that, that users had. One was this kind of struggle to keep up to date with changes to the C++ code. And the other was the fact that our, our Python API only supported the board editor. If you wanted to mm -hmm. write code against the schematic or other parts yeah. of KiCad, it simply wasn't possible. So the new API we're working on is designed to support all of KiCad, not just the PCB editor. And what we see people doing with that, we already have some ideas, but I just know as soon as it's out there, you know, people will start working on it and they'll come up with things that I, I haven't even thought of. Yeah. But once you can write Python programs, it becomes possible to expand what KiCad does without waiting for us, the core developers, to implement something in C++ and release a new KiCad version. Some of the Python plugin developers have been you know, releasing new versions of their plugins on a weekly or sometimes even daily basis. And you can install a new version of a plugin without updating the core of KiCad. Yeah. And the new stable API will let plugin authors write code that they can sort of depend on continuing to work as, as new KiCad versions come out and users can trust that the, the Python API sort of limits what uh, people can do. The new Python API, the old Python API had, had some you know, ways, ways in which it could be misused where you could even cause KiCad to crash. And so we want to yeah. sort of solve those problems as well so that the, the Python plug plugins can be, can be more trusted. But as to what people can do with this, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of things that people uh, will think of, but generally it's it's automation. So yeah. if you wanted to do something that was very specific to your workflow, like say you wanted to take all of the components in a schematic and change change some properties of their fields in a particular way um, that was suited to your company or something like that, you could write a plugin to do that. Or if you wanted to go and, and look up prices for parts on your chosen uh, distributor of parts, you could write a plugin to do that and put that part information in your bomb. Things like that where it might be pretty specific to your application and so we might not develop a general KiCad feature for it. You can write those specific features quickly and easily and, and expand KiCad to your own preferences. Great, so it seems like this is becoming a, like a, a, a core feature of uh, KiCad 6 and beyond. Um, I, I do have a follow-up question on this, uh, on, on the state of plugins and the future, because uh, as I was playing around with KiCad 5.9, I could see a lot of evidence of um, you know, the, the plugin components becoming more important than they had been in the past. So now I want to ask you this, there's already 
an ecosystem of kicker plugins, as you said, they really work in PCB new um, because there's no capability to do such thing in EE schema that, that is coming in kicker six. So my question has got two parts. Number one, uh, what is going to happen to those older plugins? Will they be working in kicker six uh, or will they, will they need to be modified? And, and part two, maybe you can blend them together is, is this, if, plugins through the Python API becoming so much more important and therefore useful. It means that people will be using that capability and they will be creating plugins that others will be able to use. Uh, it could be free plugins. I can even see an ecosystem of paid plugins or higher quality plugins that can pass certain standards of quality. How do you see that uh, forming in the future? For example, will there be some kind of um, a registry for plugins that people can download from? Um, would there be some kind of organized ecosystem like we can see in other projects? Um, it could be a bit of an open ended question, but I wonder what your thoughts are about uh, when it comes to a plugin ecosystem. Absolutely. Um, so the first part of that question, will plugins that were written for KiCad 5 need to be updated for 6? And the answer is uh, usually small tweaks will be needed. Um, some some might work without any changes, but there have been some small changes to the old API in PCB new that will have broken some Python scripts where they just need to change the name of some function call or something like this. And some plugin authors are already doing this. They're you know posting nightly build versions of their plugins, and I, I don't see any more changes coming to the old API. So it's really up to plugin authors to decide what they want to do if they want to support nightly builds or if they want to wait for the stable release and then update their plugins. Yeah. And it's, it's really up to how much time they have to keep track of changes in the nightly builds. The new Python APIs that are planned are, are going to be separate from the old APIs. So new scripts will have to be written against the new APIs, but there will be this transition period oh, where, right. where both APIs will exist in KiCad 6. So the old scripts will be able to use the old APIs as long as they make those minor adjustments. And right. to the second part of your question, I think is pretty interesting as well. I would love to see such an ecosystem where people can go to a registry of plugins and see user reviews and ratings and things like that. I think it's going to need some some effort from various parties who are going to need to help out with something like that. Of course, we need some kind of a, a web presence and software on the web to handle uh, distributing plugins and, and keeping track of ratings and reviews and things like that. And I think it, it goes beyond what the core KiCad team can do by ourselves, but I think it's definitely going to be important for the ecosystem. So I, there's already been some discussions about how to make this happen. And I think there will be more, more involved and more serious discussions once the new API is merged into the nightly builds and people can start testing it out and, and getting ideas about what to do with it. So hmm. I, I think we don't have uh, immediate plans to, you know, when, when KiCad 6 is released, there will be a, you know, there won't be some KiCad plugin store that immediately shows up. And, um, but I, but I think it's a wonderful idea and it's, obviously something that would help the Python ecosystem a lot. Yeah, I think that would be amazing. Uh, you can like uh, just becoming inspired from other open source projects like Python itself, for example, and how easy it is to get Python modules written by third party developers, just one command and it's installed and then it just works. <laughs> that would be uh, like a very good target to have. But of course, uh, over time, I think the API is the first component that needs to be in place before people start exploring possibilities there. Yes, okay. and even, even before we have some kind of nice uh, web service where people can, can put their plugins and things like that, we are planning to make it a little bit easier to, to install plugins than it was in, in previous versions of KiCad, just to make it that much easier for, for users to get involved with the plugin ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, would that be in 6.0 or perhaps um, like 6.5 maybe? Push it a little later. The plan later. is for that to be in 6.0, so we'll, okay. we'll see how it goes. <laughs> cool. um, but yes, currently, currently we plan in 6.0 to have the new API and to have also the 
um, you know, the, the plugin manager to make it a little bit easier to, to install plugins. Yeah, great. It seems like Christmas might be coming early this year. <laughs> All right. Okay, I think uh, let's move away from plugins now. Let's uh, have a look at some other submitted questions. So this one is from Alan. So um, Alan is interested uh, to know what happens after curved traces. So we now have curved traces. It's amazing. Um, it, do you think there's going to be some kind of tools that can produce other types of like other geometries of traces? Yeah, so there, there's a number of different ways I could answer that. You know, what, what's next after curved traces? You know, there's maybe a hundred things that we're thinking about next, but maybe I'll focus on on traces in particular and improvements that we're thinking about for the, the routing of traces. So right now, um, the router in KiCad has, has some set of capabilities for, um, for working with single traces, for working with differential pairs and things like that. It's a lot better than it used to be, but it, it's not nearly as full featured as the kind of interactive router that you can see in some of the higher end commercial packages. So some of the things we're thinking about are, um, for example, having the router be able to automatically change the width of tracks while you route. This would allow things like automatic neck downs to fit through tight spaces mm -hmm. and escape from BGAs. And it would also allow things like defining different trace widths for a controlled impedance line on different layers and having the router automatically change to the correct width when you change layers with a via without having to manually change width. Um, another thing we're thinking about is uh, routing multiple traces at once. So the diff pair you know, handles the, the plus and the minus trace at once, but we want to expand that to the general yeah. case. Maybe you can take a whole bus of signals and, and route them as one and, and place a bunch of vias together in different patterns to change layers. So those are just a few of the things off the top of my head that we're looking at with the router. And some of the other things that might be interesting for copper shapes, we want to make it easier for, for people to do more advanced copper shapes. So we've already done some work that is in six, or is in the nightly builds already, will be in six, such as making it easy to define custom shape pads in footprints. It was already possible, but it was kind of clunky, so it's now much easier. And we've also made it easier to import shapes that were designed in a different CAD program, maybe a mechanical CAD program, and convert them into copper pads or traces. So for uh, very, very particular applications, such as some RF and magnetic applications, you might want to design a pad or a trace or an antenna or something like that, and then import it into KiCad. So that's a little bit easier now, and we have some other improvements um, in the roadmap for future versions there. Yeah, you can already, like speaking of pads, you can already in KiCad 599 um, create all sorts of different shapes. Um, like uh, we can control the various parameters, for example, of a curved or, um, or a rectangular type of pad. So a lot of that has been already parameterized. So you're talking about a, a lot more beyond that, uh, importing yeah. pads from other tools. I think the most important part of that that is not in six and is currently planned to be in the next version after six is full pad stack support. Mm. So this means for pads and for vias, being able to find a different shape for that pad on every layer. So you can have pads where you have a, you know, a square on the back layer and no pad at all on the top layer mm -hmm. or uh, better control over vias in case you need uh, back drilling or things like that to eliminate stubs in really high frequency situations. Cool. That's for kick at seven, right? You, you, uh, like you yeah, push it to that, yeah. All right. Okay, let's move on. Um, the next one is from Lars. Um, so Lars is interested in the new bus features. Uh, so you've extended the way that buses work and you can use now expressions to match uh, nets together into a single bus. And Lars is wondering if you could actually delay um, setting the, actually delay setting the, um, the bus uh, uh, by making it possible so he's got an, a long question. I'm trying to shape it uh, concisely. So he says it'd be useful as an example in an MCU, like a microcontroller unit uh, 
that is connected to a static RAM chip, where it doesn't matter how you route the individual traces of the bus. So instead of doing the routing in the schematic to allow for the writing of a bus and its components to be, to be done inside um, the layout, and then once layout decides how to do the routing to send that information back to the schematic just so that you have completeness there as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that's possible now, right? Uh, but he, Lars is asking if that might be possible in the future. Yes, um, this is, um, I think if I understand correctly, this is a, a feature that we call pin swapping. And this is a feature that is not in six, you're right, but it's planned for version seven at the moment. Mm -hmm. And this is another one of the, the key features that uh, commercial high-end layout packages have that KiCad doesn't have yet. Yeah. So it's a pretty high priority for version seven. So what pin swapping is, it's a way to define for particular parts, this group of pins can be swapped around in a certain way. Maybe like the example from, from Lars, you have a whole set of lines and it doesn't matter what order they go in. Or maybe there are some lines and they can be swapped, but in a more restricted way, like you can only swap one with three and two with four or something yeah. like that. But basically, you can define how this works in, in your symbol and in your footprint. And then at layout time, you can make those choices based on what would make the, the routing the easiest and then push that back to the schematic. So yes, uh, it's, a, it's a good idea and it is, it is on the roadmap. Perfect, yeah. All right, there you go, Lars. <laughs> All right, next one um, from Lee. Lee's interested in what's going on with netlists. Um, and uh, he's asking about what is the outlook for the netlist file. It seems like he's considering the netlist file as being particularly useful for applications where you want to interact with other external applications like uh, the HDL and very low applications and use it as so an I'm, interchange file. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing Lee saw some some comments that the uh, netlist file is is no longer required for passing data back and forth between the schematic and the board yeah. in, in, in KiCad. And uh, don't worry, the netlist file is is very much still available. It's uh, it's one of the things that can be exported, and so we definitely still have all of the same capabilities for exporting netlists in a in a few different formats, for talking to different different applications. Some people use it for for doing routing and for for doing simulation and and for interfacing with HDL tools, like Lee mentioned. Yeah. So that's that's very much still an option. It's just no longer part of the workflow inside KiCad. Okay, so it's now just a, a way to export data from um, the schematic so that you can do something useful with the data. Perfect, all right. Um, next one's from me. <laughs> I wonder what's the story and the progress when it comes to import tools, um, in particular Eagle. So like uh, I, I work with Arduinos, for example, you, you probably know that. And um, Arduino publishes the schematics for the various boards uh, from Eagle. I've imported them into KiCad 6 using the Eagle import tool. And it does kind of work, uh, but it uh, still requires a lot of manual you know, editing to get things right. So I wanted to ask you, how is the import tool going for Kicket 6 from Eagle, but perhaps you no know, other tools as well that you might have in your radar? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'll say uh, we welcome uh, bug reports on, on the importers and if there's if there's something that is uh, not quite right when you import a schematic using one of the formats that we support, or or a board, um, just just open an issue for it, and it's it's possible we hadn't seen it before. So the Eagle importer is is uh, something that's been around for a while. It's not new for version six. It's gotten some minor improvements so far for version six, but I think there's off the top of my head not very many things that we know about and are planning to fix for, for version six with the Eagle importer in particular. So I would, I would definitely encourage you to, if, if you have any issues, especially if they're breaking your design and um, to, to report them so that we know about them. I would say mm -hmm. with Eagle, one of the challenges with importing Eagle designs, particularly with importing Eagle schematics is that Eagle and KiCad have fairly different sort of uh, internal models for how 
connections work on a schematic. The rules are different. And, and whenever you're converting between two different worlds that have different rules, it's hard to do something exactly. And so we have to make some compromises when importing Eagle schematics because of those differences. And we, we don't see those same compromises in some other tools just because those other tools happen to have a, a model of connections in the schematic that's a little bit closer to KiCads. Yeah, I should just clarify that when I do such an import, the layout works out perfect. Um, I haven't noticed any problems in the layout. It's the schematic, as you said, that I see the problems there with, for example, symbols missing. So Kika doesn't know what symbol was used in uh, Eagle. So it just has a question mark usually or a blob. I can't remember exactly how the symbology works, uh, but the, uh, the layout is perfect. But yeah, next time I will file in a report, uh, especially when it comes to you know, the EE schema side, which seems mm -hmm. to be more problematic. Um, I, 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 yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I thought I'd ask this question because uh, many of the comments that I get is from people that are working on different tools right now, and uh, they would like to be able to bring their projects across to uh, to keep to keep it over time. And I guess that's where import becomes important. Absolutely. So all of our different importers have come from a sort of a, a champion developer who is able to both work on KiCad code and is motivated yeah. to to move away from a certain tool. So we've actually added two new importers in version six this way, one from Altium Designer and its uh, related products like Altium Circuit Maker and one from uh, CADSTAR. So both of these were done by two different people who you know, had, had access to those tools and had the ability to sort of uh, check that the importer was doing the right thing on their own designs. So as those, um, you know, it's, it's always difficult with reverse engineering because all of these formats are, for the most part, uh, you know, Eagle is a little bit different in that in, um, some, some of the Eagle file formats are, are published, but some of these other formats, you just have to reverse engineer them and hope for the best. Yeah. And so when, when the importers get out there, people use them on their own designs and find things that we didn't know about or we didn't do correctly and 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 they evolve over time so i would i would expect those to to keep getting better as people report issues about them but already we've had a lot of people testing those new importers and and having some success so i'm looking forward to kicad being able to help help people who who have legacy designs in some of those tools as well yeah, it is a difficult problem. I typically suggest to people that start your new project in KiCad, right? Um, so that it's clean and uh, you don't have to worry about the transition over. Okay, um, next one is from Nicholas. So um, Nicholas is, uh, has got actually two questions. And uh, the first one has to do with S expressions. And he's asking, what is your reasoning behind choosing S expressions as the file format for the E schema and, and the layout now, instead of something more common as JSON or YAML? Mm -hmm. So that decision was a little bit before my time on the project. And mm. part of the reason why we have decided in version six to move the schematic file format to be S expressions as, as well as the PCB, which has been S expressions for a long, long time, is just because it, that decision was already made and it made more sense to keep using the format than to move all of the file formats yet again you know, the, the PCB and the footprint format um, got some minor changes to add new features and, and fix some bugs in version six, but it also, also from a high level looks pretty similar to the format in, in version five. Yeah. And for the file formats, you know, everyone can have their opinion about, about file formats. I think one of the things that we like about S expressions that is, uh, you know, it's not unique to S expressions, um, but it, it is a property is that it's, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty strongly typed language, so to speak. You know, we, we construct a, a, a grammar of what a KiCad file means, and it's, it's not really open to interpretation. So that means that um, when, when we're importing files or we're opening files, um, we can be pretty sure what the files are supposed to be. And um, it, there are not... Um, as ambiguous as, as some of those formats like JSON, where 
We use we use JSON as well. We use it uh, for configuration files and and for Gerber, Gerber job files and things like that, where things can be a little bit more flexible. It's okay for for things to be missing. You know, if a configuration value is just missing, KiCad can assume that it's the default value and things like that. Yeah. In the file formats, we want things to be a little bit more rigid, but you know, why S expressions? Uh, just because someone decided that and um, wrote the code for it and you know, it's not it's not perfect, but also it's there and it's working. And so I think we have uh, we have better things to do than uh, change it just be for the sake of changing it. Yeah. No, I think Nicolas was uh, was curious. Um, I don't, he's not suggesting change, of course, but he's curious about whether there is something unique in his expressions. I think what you said about it being strongly typed and therefore there's no ambiguity. I can see that is quite important, and that could be why it was selected by. Uh, you know, we ever made mm -hmm. the selection in the olden days, um, and uh, it's 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 pretty good. It works, it works well, All right? So <laughs> let's keep it. <laughs> As you said, there's other things to do, other things to worry about. Now, the other question from Nicholas uh, has to do with um, uh, setting up board house technology preferences, um, and um, he's asking whether Kicker Six will have an import export technology file, I guess that the manufacturing house will be able to publish on the website, then I'll be able to download it, import it into my KiCad instance, and then my KiCad instance would know what I can and can't do so that my eventual design is compatible with that manufacturer's capabilities. So do you think that something like that is coming? Yes, so we we don't have a separate file format that's just like a technology file format. I, I know some other tools have this kind of thing. Um, we we might be open to adding that in the future. It, 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 um, I think it just hasn't hasn't made the cut yet for for version six. So what what we do have is all of the design rules in in a project file format. Those those are stored in in JSON, mm -hmm. um, the sort of the standard design rules, and so it would be possible for manufacturers to publish these in a format that KiCad can import. It just wouldn't be uh, this kind of technology file format that its only purpose is to uh, convey board house uh, capabilities and things like that. So it's definitely possible. It just doesn't work quite the same way as, as some other software tools do. And yeah. It's it definitely something we're open to to changing in the future. It's also something that we, um, you know, speaking of the Python API, think that people yeah. could do with the Python API is it, it should be possible to write a Python program that goes and collects requirements from a certain board house and, and applies them to a design or something like that. There you go. Um, that, that's a good suggestion, actually. So that's another uh, another reason why the Python API could be a game changer in a lot of these questions asking for potential features in future editions can actually be satisfied through uh, Python script taking advantage of the new API. Cool. Uh, next one. Um, Vasilis is asking if there's any plans for auto writing. Auto -routing. So currently there are external tools that we use for auto routing. Is it anything that is planned to be integrated perhaps? Currently, we're not planning on working on an auto router, and I'll I'll say a little bit more about this because I, I know this is a kind of a uh, divisive topic sometimes for some people. So, auto routers are are very complicated pieces of software to create. Um, I've I've used a number of them, and what I'll say is um, the results I've had with them have been mixed, even with the routers that were created by teams of paid software engineers working for years they sometimes didn't end up saving as much time as they promised. They created things that needed a lot of cleanup and yep. they require a lot of setup time. Now, I, I have designed big boards. I fully know there are situations where auto routers are useful. What I am not sure about is where the KiCad team should prioritize that relative to some of the other things we could be working on. When we go and talk to people who are designing uh, boards in KiCad every day, especially those who are working on advanced boards and those people who work in multiple tools, we have a number of users where they do some boards in KiCad and they do some boards in, in Allegro or Altium or 
or some other paid product where KiCad's capabilities just can't deliver the same efficiency they need, auto routing usually doesn't come up as a feature request yeah, from, yeah. from those people. Usually what comes up is uh, things like um, better interactive routing, like I was talking about earlier, being able to route whole buses at once, um, being able to do more targeted auto routing, like uh, being able to automatically fan out a BGA or being able to, once you have routed something 90% of the way, just sort of finish it up. Or things like um, giving the router a, a kind of a sketch of how you want traces to flow and the router solving the details of making the traces follow that sketch and look nice and things like that. Yeah. So first I'll say our, our team of people who know how to work on the router is, is very small. It's, it's really just a few people and they're volunteers and it's fairly complicated software. It's, it's no doubt the most complicated part of KiCad is the router. <laughs> and when we look at the kinds of uh, things that would be possible for us to add, I just don't think an auto router is in the cards right now. Uh, even if there were universal high demand for it, which currently it's not really clear that that's you know the highest priority for all our users, um, we we just wouldn't have the developers to do a good auto router. And I'm not sure doing a poor auto auto router would be a, a good use of our time. So we'll we'll definitely continue to support the workflows using external auto routers, but uh, unless something significant changes with our our resources and our ability to you know have have developers working on the the really hard problems that are behind automatic routing in general, I don't see us having a, a full board auto router anytime soon. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, you nailed it. Uh, that that's kind of how I feel. Um, I, I don't work on complicated boards myself, but uh, they are boards that are not really affected by the intricacies of how the auto router work. So I see the auto router myself as a time saving tool and um, then an external auto router just works perfectly. But uh, I, I had discussions with people that do build uh, much more complicated and high speed boards with RF requirements, et cetera. And then the, an auto router, uh, breaks down, it's just not useful enough. So um, I think that is, um, uh, that case is rested. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. The next one um, is in relation to drawing tools. Um, I don't have a, a first name for the person that asked for this question, so um, uh, that's okay. He's asking if there are going to be any kind of improvements to the drawing tools, he gives examples the ability to trim, for example, snapping or adding offsets, uh, parametric constraints uh, between lines and component distances, um, things of that sort. Yes, so in, in 6.0, I would say the, the biggest improvements to drawing are um, a few new drawing primitives. So now it's easy to draw things like rectangles and arcs and some improvements to snapping. Um, snapping to different points on objects works a lot better than it did in old versions. Some of the other things on that list, you know, trimming lines, constraints, and, and uh, parametric design elements are, are not in KiCad yet. And in terms of what will be in KiCad in the future, we're still trying to figure that out. I think there is um, a line to be drawn somewhere if we're considering how to use our, our limited developer time. There are tools that are specializing in mechanical design that have extremely complex drawing tools, um, you know, FreeCAD, for example, if you stay within the open source world, where they have parametric CAD engines where you can do all of these things and then import into KiCad. So at some point, it doesn't make sense for us to duplicate all of the work of those external tools when we could just work on better interoperation between KiCad and, yeah. and mechanical CAD tools. But I think there is still room for us to add some of those things to KiCad. I just think we will probably not prioritize making KiCad into as good of a mechanical drawing tool as, as a dedicated mechanical drawing tool. Um, it, you know, there's just other things that are specific to electrical CAD that we could be spending time on. And it always comes down to, you know, how do we spend our time? We don't, we don't have that large a team and 
you know, everything I say could change if we, you know, suddenly get to twice the number of developers. But looking at where we are right now, I think, uh, you know, we're we're thinking about some some kinds of simple constraints. We're thinking about, uh, you know, things like an offset tool would be pretty easy. Um, but kind of the the full parametric sketching that you get in a mechanical tool, um, I think, might be a little bit far off. Yeah, uh, I think it's probably easier to learn FreeCAD for anyone who's interested in this kind of capabilities, right? And uh, I, I'm going to look into that as well. I, I have been playing around with FreeCAD, uh, but I haven't needed uh, I haven't needed to use it for a particular project yet. But this is something that. I'm going to investigate closer. So you can see the synergy between the, these two open source tools. So I may be able to do something about that. <laughs> All right, um, John, I've got one more question to complete uh, this, uh, this session. It has to do with sharing projects between uh, Kikat users. So I wanted to ask you this. So now that both the schematic and the layout parts of KiCad use the same kind of format. And as far as I know, also um, these files are self-contained. It means that whatever footprints or um, symbols are required can be stored within the same schematic and layout file instead of relaying with, uh, instead of relying to links to external libraries. Uh, is it possible then to just package a KiCad project uh, perhaps in a zip file or some somehow else, perhaps a single or maybe, maybe two S expression files, and then email them to a colleague who then will be able to open them up in their own KiCad instance and continue working without them having to chase uh, library files elsewhere? Yes. So um, there, there's a few exceptions, but in general, that works pretty well now. Uh, it works a lot better than it did in previous versions. So like you said, our, our new schematic file format stores the symbols inside the schematic, which means um, they can always be updated from an external library, but that external library doesn't need to be present for the schematic mm. to open. And there's no separate uh, cache library file like we had in, in previous yeah. versions of KiCad. So you can take a KiCad schematic file without any other files and, and send it around and it will open. And in terms of the whole project, uh, yes, you can absolutely package it up in a zip and, and send it around. We even have a, a feature to do that automatically from the project manager. You can click a button and create a zip file. And there are a, a few things to watch out for when you do that. One is uh, 3D models. So if you use 3D models in the footprints, those currently aren't saved inside the footprints or inside the board. So you need to be able to find those on, on whatever computer um, in order to show the 3D preview or to export a, a step model. Um, but other than that, it generally works pretty well to move designs around between different people on different computers. And um, you only would need to also have the libraries if you wanted to make updates to those libraries or, or pull in new changes from the libraries. Great. And all of those files, those shareable files, they're all text-based files, right? Which means that you can use source control and uh, you've got everything there as well. So that's an additional, I guess, intermediary yep. or mechanism for sharing, not just email, just, yes. just and, check uh, them in. We, we know a lot of users use source control with uh, KiCad designs and we encourage that. Um, and one of the things that we've done with the file formats in version six is made some tweaks to minimize the amount of uh, what we call churn um, in the files. So useless changes to the files when you didn't actually change something in the design. Um, we've, we've eliminated almost all of that. And I think we've eliminated all of that in the board files now. So basically, um, they're, they work a lot better with version control systems. In, in, in previous, um, in, in KiCad 5, when you open a board and, and you change, you know, what layer you're looking at or you show and hide layers, all of that is saved in the board file. And so just by viewing a board, you can mark it as modified. And then if you're using a version control system, that gets messy. Um, in, in KiCad 6, we've pulled all of those things out into a, a project file. And we actually have two project files now. One of them is designed to be checked in with the design files to your source control. And it contains all of the important project information and, and design rules and things like that. And the other file is, is kind of like a local state project file. 
and it contains things like what layer you are looking at and what okay. you know whether or not high contrast mode is turned on and, and PCB new and things like that. So what it means is you can close and reopen KiCad for the same design and get back your view exactly the way you had it. But you can also ignore this one file if you are um, checking it into source control or if you are zipping it up and um, all of your all of your changes that are just for how you view it are in this one file that that you can exclude. Perfect. Okay. Uh, is that is there some documentation where we can find out, for example, which is the file that contains your project specifics, uh, say state of layers that mm -hmm. you're looking at? Yes. So the the KiCad documentation is very much a, a work in progress. If anyone has has gone to our documentation site, you'll know it's been a struggle to keep it updated as we make changes to the program. We're in the middle of an effort to prepare for the version six release by getting rid of all of the old information and writing new documentation for all of the new tools. Some of the documents haven't been updated since version four even, so they're, they're quite out of date. Um, one of them that has already been updated is the, the main documentation for, for the KiCad program. So our, our documentation is split yeah. up into different chapters for different sub-programs. The one for the KiCad project manager program has been updated already. If you're on our documentation site, you just have to make sure that you're looking at the, the nightly documentation and not the stable release. But there we have a description of all the different file types that KiCad uses and some notes about you know, which ones should be checked into source control if you use it and, and things like that. I'll check it out. Okay, um, that's it, John. Thank you very much. That was extremely helpful. Um, thank you for uh, making the time to talk to me today. Absolutely, it was great to talk to you and, and, and great to hear some of the questions.